So as I alluded to, one of the goals of this series is to help us all to gain a right biblical view on money and have the right perspective on money. And our tagline does say it best. It's redefining prosperity because biblical prosperity is so much bigger than how much money you have in the bank and how many cars you have in the driveway and how many toys you have in the garage. It's, it's so much bigger than our wealth and our possessions. And Pastor Dave said it this way last week. He said that biblical prosperity is having everything I need to do the will of God. And the more I read my Bible, the more I realize just how important this topic of giving is. It's important to God, it was important to Jesus, and it should be important to us as Christ followers. Look what, uh, look what we can find in Acts 20, verse 35, the second part. It says, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I just want you to know, Pastor Daniel didn't say that, Pastor Jesus said that. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And I learned in Bible college there's a concept called keywords. And throughout the scriptures, there are keywords that are used over and over and over again. And that helps us to understand what's important to God that he would put these keywords in his word in his Bible. And let me just show you what some of these words are. It's words like this: belief. 275 times we find this word believe in the scripture. What to believe, how to believe. We also see the word pray. Well, that sounds like a pretty common word in the Bible. 371 times, how to pray, when to pray, what to pray for. And then of course the word love. Well, we know God is love, so of course that word's in there a lot, 744 times. But look at this, the word give is in the Bible over 2,100 times more than those other three keywords combined. I'm just trying to get you to understand today, we're talking about giving in church because the Bible talks about giving a lot. I want you to know that this is an important topic to God. He's like, I wanna make sure you get this. I, wanna, I know you're gonna have some struggles. I know that some people, it's not gonna be their natural tendency to get this. So God says, I'm gonna talk about this in my book a lot because I need my people to get this. So here's what I want you to know. While, while talking about giving may be uncomfortable for some of us today, it's certainly not uncomfortable for God. God talks about giving a lot. Why? Because he's a giver. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. And Jesus so loved the world that he gave his life for us. So we're, we're gonna talk about this topic that I think is, is central, it's core, to the life of a believer. And the more you read the Bible, I think you'll find that. The more you read it, the more you'll realize just how central giving is to the Christian faith. So I'm just saying today, to kick things off, if you want to be more like Jesus, and I hope you do, that's, that's my goal, I wanna look more like Jesus, wanna become more like Jesus so I can do the things that Jesus did. And I'm saying if you wanna be more like Jesus, which is really this, the goal of the faith, then you've gotta learn to be a giver. You've gotta learn this. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you said Jesus is Lord, then I think what we really need to talk about today is this idea of giving because some people say he's Lord, but they leave this part out of the equation. And I just wanna tell you, some people get hung up on tithing, some people get hung up on generosity, but I want you to get free in this area. And so here's how we get free. Look with me at Psalm 119.45. It says, I have gained perfect freedom by following your teachings. Can I tell you, the ways of the world will always bind you up and the ways of God and his word will always make you free. And that's what I'm here to do today. I'm here to be a good pastor. I'm gonna go to the Bible. We're gonna look at what the, not culture, not the world, not your friends, not your family. What does the Bible say about giving? What does the Bible say about tithing? And I'm telling you, you're gonna find freedom in this area if you allow God to speak to you. So we're gonna understand God's principles. That's really what this is all about. His principles and his blessings when it comes to giving and generosity and even sowing and reaping. In order to do that though, we have to kind of go back to the Old Testament and go back to some old scriptures that still have meaning and purpose today. And so ultimately, here's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk to you about trusting God and putting him first in every area of your life, including in our money. And so, so we can all just make sure we're on the same page together here. Uh, wouldn't you agree that God wants to be first in your life? 
He's not interested in being number five. He's not interested in being in your top three. God wants to be first in every area of your life. That's why the first commandment was this, that thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is why Jesus said the greatest commandment is that we would love the Lord our God with, love the Lord our God with what? All that we have, all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our soul, all of our heart. Everything that we have is supposed to be putting God first. We should have no other gods before him. So for the next few minutes, I wanna talk about something that I think will actually help you do this, putting God first, and it is the tithe. God, giving to God what is his, the first fruits, the first tenth. Look at Deuteronomy 14, 23, and I think this is gonna be a good place to help you today, lean in, because look at what it says, the purpose of tithing, all right, so lean in. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. Woo. Here's what I need you to get today before we go any further. The purpose of tithing is to teach me to put God first. So I'm here to tell you today that I believe there is a divine assignment on tithing. There is a divine power and promise attached to this principle that there is something that God supernaturally does in our lives when we get in sync with his truth in this area that he begins to help us in every other area of our life to put God first. Now, I, there are so many different scriptures I could go to today to, to look at on the tithe, but I want us to go back to that Old Testament book, Malachi. In fact, it's the last book of the Old Testament, right before Matthew. And I need you to know this, that the whole theme of Malachi is about God's people who have wandered away from him and his teachings coming back to God, coming back to his ways, coming back to his principles. So in Malachi, we're gonna go to chapter three and begin in verse six. He says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. This is what theologians call the immutability of God because God cannot and he does not change because in order for God to change, he would have to become a little better or a little worse and God can't do either of those since he's already perfect in all his ways. Can you say amen? So he says, I'm the Lord, I do not change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so here's what I want you to catch here. This God who established tithing says, I cannot change. And this is important because a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, we're talking about tithing today. I just, I'm just saying that's an old covenant thing. Tithing doesn't apply to me today in 2024 because tithing was old covenant. It's the law. Tithing is the law. And since I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. This doesn't apply to me anymore. I'm here today to make a public service announcement about those people who say those things. Here it is. That is unreasonable reasoning. It's unreasonable reasoning to say, oh, it's under the law. It doesn't apply anymore. You know what else was under the law? Thou shalt not murder. So I'm supposed to say, well, I'm under grace. It doesn't apply to me anymore. Or what about this one? Um, the law also says that thou shalt not commit adultery. Could you imagine me going home today and being like, Heather, huh, I'm under grace. I guess I can, woohoo, just do whatever I want. No. And you'll know if that happens to me because they'll find me in a trunk somewhere. And that would be because Heather made sure the last time I was under grace. <laughs> Praise God. So I need you to understand that there were some things when the law that we ought not to do and we also ought to do, and those things still apply today. See, there were moral implications of this thing called the law. That's what's right, what's wrong, what's godly, what's not godly, and those things didn't change because Jesus came and fulfilled the ceremonial, the ritual parts of the law. He became that sacrifice so we don't have to kill calves and goats anymore. He became that sacrifice for us, but it didn't mean that we can live however we want to. In fact, I could argue today that because Jesus fulfilled the law and I'm under grace, I ought to give more than 10%. I ought to give more than what's required. I ought to give more than what's a normal offering. I ought to be able to say, because of his grace, I'm gonna go over and above. So that's the way I view this. And I encourage you to view it the same, that, that we don't use that excuse that it's under the law. No, I'm gonna show you today. I'm gonna do a, my, my best job to show you that the tithe is beyond, it's, it's past, present, and future. When, when we talk about the, the legalistic law, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. If it's right then, I'm telling you it's right now. Let's keep going. Verse six, 
We'll keep reading it. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Now watch this. He says, therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. I love this. Because God says, therefore you are not consumed. In other words, he's saying, you're not gonna be destroyed. In other words, I'm, God is saying, I'm gonna stay committed to you even though you weren't committed to me. I'm going to stay committed to your good even though you've wandered away and as you're coming back, I'm saying I'm not going to let you be destroyed. Look at verse 7. We'll keep reading. Yet from the days of your fathers, God says, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me. Hear his language, hear his heart. Come back to the right thing. Come back to the right way. He says, if you do if you do that, if you return to me, I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, let's look at this word he uses. He says, you have gone away from my ordinances. This word, ordinance, is an interesting word. The root word is the word ordinary. I think we can see that. But when you add the suffix A-N-C-E, it becomes ordinance. And anytime you see that suffix, it speaks to a principle. And so when we break it down, an ordinance, go with me here, is a principle of ordinary behavior. So God is saying, you walked away from some ordinary behaviors of my people. You've gone away from this. And Malachi is telling the people, you've forgotten who you are. You've forgotten whose you are. And he's saying, we are a people who tithe. Let's come back and do the good that we ought to do. These are God's ways and you've abandoned them. Are you still with me? Now, we understand ordinances, right? Sometimes we, we, we are made aware of ordinances we have in our city, you know, ordinances that we have in our community. Like, you can't just let your grass be whatever it wants. You, you can't just plant trees wherever. You can't put a sign in your front yard. Like, there's ordinances because th- th- this is ordinary behavior. You should live a certain way. I remember I, I used to youth pastor in Peachtree City many years ago, and uh, we did a big youth event, and I had the bright idea. Let's put a spotlight in the parking lot that will... F- so we'll attract people from everywhere, you know? And, and I found out really quickly, Peachtree City let me know that you can't do that because that is a light pollution situation. And we have an ordinance that you can't just put how much light you want in the sky. You can't just use a searchlight like that. And I, was, I realized, well, so this isn't ordinary behavior in Peachtree City. <laughs> no, we got to drive around in our golf carts and play golf and all that, but we can't use a light in the parking lot. Praise the Lord. Or put up any extra signs, unless it looks this way and it's gotta be brick and it's gotta be just the right way, okay. It's an ordinance. I'm here to tell you today that God is saying, I've got some ordinances in my kingdom and what's ordinary for people who love me, who trust me, who put their faith in me, what's ordinary is that you bring the first tent into the storehouse. This is what God is saying to us is normal for believers. And he's saying, I'm inviting you to return to these ways since you've wandered off. Let's keep reading verses seven through nine. I know I'm moving fast. Watch this. But you said, in what way shall we return? And then God, watch what he says. He asks a question. They ask a question, he asks a question. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. And then look at what God says. He says, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now it's important to note here, God is not cursing them. God does not curse his children. If you don't tithe, what I'm not saying today is, if you don't tithe, you are cursed by God because God doesn't curse his kids. He chastises, he corrects, he disciplines, but he does not curse them. But what does it say in verse nine? It says you are cursed with a curse. So what I need you to see here today is when you don't apply this principle, you can put yourself under the economic system of this world, which is cursed. I thought I'd get an amen right there. And hear me, when you don't align yourself with the principles of the word of God, you're actually keeping yourself aligned with a system that is cursed because this world's economy is a cursed system. What am I saying? Well, it's cursed with scarcity not having enough or the fear of not having enough. This world's economy, it's, it's cursed with discontentment where I feel like I gotta keep getting more in order to keep me happy. Or maybe you could say even it's cursed with greed. I gotta get mine and I gotta hold on to it and I gotta keep it all to myself. It's a cursed system. And as long as you keep yourself away from this principle of God, the ways of God, the ordinances of God, you keep yourself under a curse and a broken system. I want to make it plain today. God doesn't want you there. 
God wants you to come under his lordship in every way and be a part of his, his economy, not the world's economy. Now, Malachi 3.10, we'll keep reading, verse 10. Many of you, you've heard this one before. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Okay, so what's going on here? This language of a storehouse and food in my house, what's all this about? Well, many of you uh, have expressed to myself or Heather or Pastor Dave or Miss Cindy over the years of coming to this church, how when you come here, you, you get fed here. You use that language. Like, Pastor Daniel, when you preached that sermon a few weeks ago, man, I just felt like that was exactly what I needed. I left church full of what God had for me. And, and that's spiritual food. That's what happens when you come to church. Right now, we've got, uh, we've got kids up in our kids' ministry, and they're getting spiritual food. They're learning about Jesus. They're learning about giving. They're learning about being generous. Uh, there, there's spiritual food when you go to small group, and someone prays, and someone shares, and then you, someone in your family dies, and then a, fa- a small group member comes to your house and provides a meal and prays for you, and that, that gives you sustenance, and that gives you spiritual food. So that's what's happening in God's house. On Sundays, on Wednesdays, throughout the week, there's, there's food in God's house. And you grow spiritually in that kind of community. So there's food in the house of God. There's food in God's house. Now, notice what God says about this. He says, bring it, bring the first fruits of all into my house so that you may be fed. God says, bring it to my house so that you may be fed. Now, maybe sometimes you have thought, you know, well, I hear what you're saying about the tithe. I see what the word is saying about the tithe, but could, could, could I take 10% of my money and, and just spread it and give it to other areas? Like maybe I give some to the church and some to the Red Cross and some to this, and maybe I wanna support another church over here because my, 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 my cousin's the pastor and I, I'm just trying to kind of just spread it around. And, and I, would say, I would say when you look at God's word, God's word really gives us clarity. Like, sure, you can give to other organizations. Heather and I do that as well. There are times where Heather and I will get prompted to give somebody money that we don't even know that we met in another state. It has nothing to do with Chapel Hill Church. It has everything to do with us just having an open hand. And so that's good, but that can't be the time. According to what God's word says, it says when you look at Malachi, we bring the tithe, the 10%, to God's house first. Everybody just say first. After that, you can give, I can give, we can give wherever we like. But you can't take the tithe and give it and put it anywhere you want. Not according to God's word. God says, test me in this and see if I won't open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much you won't even be able to contain it. But it starts with the tithe. It starts with the tenth. And by the way, this is the only place in the Bible where God says to you and me, test me in this. You can go and search your Bible if you want to, but I've never seen any other place that I've been made aware of where God says, test me in this. In fact, in other places you could even argue that it says we should not test God. And God says, I'm gonna give you a free pass right here. Test me, I dare you, basically. See if I won't bless you in such a way that you'll really live large, you'll really be able to be a blessing. So let's keep going in Malachi here. Um, God says, put me to the test, verse 11. Then God says this, when you do this, now, now get ready because anytime you see principles in scripture, principles are always gonna be attached to promise. So God says, here's the principle, and if you work the principle, you get to receive the promise, which is what? He says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. God is saying right here, he's saying, I'm gonna protect you. I'm gonna defend you. He says, I'm gonna personally rebuke the enemy that tries to devour your field and take your stuff. So from this one passage in Malachi, from this one little place and these few verses here on tithing and putting God first, it does three things. I wanna show you on the screen. It removes the curse, it rebukes the devourer, and it restores the blessing. It removes the curse because it takes you out from under the cursed economic system of this world. It rebukes the devourer because it rebukes the enemy from devouring your crops. And then lastly, it restores the blessing of God in our lives. Man, this alone should be enough for you to want to tithe. Every day for the rest of your life, God is saying, when you tithe, I'll safeguard you. I'll protect you. See, this principle is attached to a promise. So when you get in on this principle, you get in on the promise. He says, I'm going to remove the curse, rebuke the devourer, and restore the blessing. Now, let's keep going. 
I wanna share with you three truths today before you leave, three truths about the tithe. The first one is this, the tithe is a tenth. The tithe is a tenth. Tithe is actually a Hebrew word which means tenth. So it's 10% of your increase, of your income, and the Bible's real clear, it belongs to God. It's holy and set apart. In other words, when we talk about the tithe, it has a holy purpose on it. That's why God says, well, you robbed me, because to God, it has a holy purpose on it, and when you withhold it from him, it's, it's withholding something that, to God, it's, it's got a holy purpose. In other words, I'm not supposed to eat it, I'm not supposed to drive it, I'm not supposed to wear it. The first 10% belongs to God. Proverbs 3, verse 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. This is reminding us that before we do anything with what God's given us, we're supposed to bring to him what's first, what belongs to him, which is that first 10%. Why is it this way? Because why would God say the first 10%? Because God, it doesn't take faith to give God your leftovers, but it takes faith to put God first. Today, I just wanna illustrate it this way. I wanna illustrate it in a different way. I've asked some friends to come and help me to show you an illustration about when God brings things into your life and when God brings things into your life, he says, I want you to take the first 10% and give it to me. So we're gonna put those over there. I'm gonna take one of the 10 cantaloupes here and put it over here so you can see this. God says, I want you to take the first 10, 10 bananas. Cool, I got a stack of bananas over here. And then we got some small watermelons. These are nice and cute. Okay, cool. So we got 10 watermelons now and then some cauliflower and broccoli. Well, I'm not sure even God wants this. So maybe we'll just put this back over here. No, I'm kidding. We can't rob God. We gotta give God the first 10%, right? And then we got some carrots, of course. Yeah, yeah, put some carrots carrots in there. We got 10 bags of carrots, so one there. Okay, then we got some butternut squash, 10 of those. So we'll give God one of these as well. Now we got some peppers, probably about 30 peppers. We'll grab one of each color so it looks cool. Some cabbage, not sure God wants this either, but we'll put this over here and put these over here. Almost done. Okay, so we got bags of oranges and apples. Okay, so we'll just take one of each and give these to God. I'm sure, you know, God loves apples. I know I certainly do. And then we got some spaghetti squash and some lemons. Okay, so one of each, because we got 10 of those, okay? And then lastly, a pineapple. Come on, praise God for a pineapple in the building, come on. So we got one-tenth of everything over here. Now I want you for a minute just to look at this and gain perspective. Because here's what happens to some believers is, is for some reason we get hung up on this. God says, I'm gonna give you everything to be a steward over. And God says, but, but I'm gonna teach you how to trust me by just asking you for the first 10%, not the last five, the first 10%. And God says, when you trust me with the tithe, look at all that you've got left over to steward, to be faithful with, to give to others. So, see, see, God says, I'm just asking for the first tenth. I heard a story this week about a man who has some young sons and he said, I, I was teaching my young son how to give in the offering when he goes to kids church. So he said, I, I did it the best way I know how, what I did with my other son. I, I laid out 10 $1 bills and I said, okay, if you have $10, 10 $1 bills, then that means we give God the first 10. So that's one of the 10. And he said, you're gonna give that to God and then you'll have nine left. You know what the little boy said to his dad? He said, so, so God, God only asked for 10%? Why does God let us keep so much? This is the heart of a child. Why does God let us keep so much? To the kid, he got it. He got the revelation as a, probably an eight-year-old that, oh wait, it's just the first 10%? And then after I give the first 10, I get to be a faithful steward with everything else God has entrusted into my life. And when I look at this, I realize this is so minimal that after being a tither, you know what? I'm gonna be a kingdom builder. So I'm gonna take a couple of my resources and move them over here because I wanna be a part of planting churches in Africa where they don't have a building to sit in. Oh, and by the way, I heard we're sending some of our young people to camp and I heard that there's a couple young people that you know, they don't have enough money to go to summer camp. Well, not on my watch. I'm gonna help these kids go to camp and experience God. I'm gonna help these kids go and hear the gospel. And see what happens is as you, as you trust God with the 10%, you begin to see I've got enough to still be generous. So if I 
gonna find out Gunner. Maybe Gunner's car broke down and he needs some help. I'm gonna help Gunner out. I found out Brian Taylor's having an issue and he doesn't know where he's gonna be able to pay for this next thing. He's gotta fix something on his car. Well, while I'm helping people fix cars, I'm gonna help you fix your car. And then I find out Kalia. Maybe Kalia's coming to the end of her schooling for counseling and she's saying, I wanna go to this conference because I wanna learn how to be a better counselor in our church. And she says, but I don't know how I'm gonna get there. And I'm gonna say, you know what, Kalia? I'm gonna help you out too. And I'm gonna help you make a difference in your life. Um, this is living large. You ought to give God praise. This is what prosperity looks like. I'm saying I've been so blessed that now I can be a blessing. Oh, but I've got to start here with this 10%. And can I just encourage you? I don't want, I don't want anybody in this church or anybody in the faith to, to get confused. And when things get tight or things get tough, the tendency would be, the temptation would be, well, you know what? This month, I don't know how it's going to work. I got to just, oh. Okay, let's bring this back over here. I'm gonna bring this back over here because if I keep giving the tithes and offerings, man, I might not be able to do what I need to do over here. And we try to hang on and hold on. And, and some of you in this room, I know I'm stepping on your toes, but you're hung up in this area. And I'm trying to tell you, if you could get the truth on this, your life would be blessed. You would be overflowing in abundance, able to help people more than you could have ever imagined. But you gotta get to the place where you say, I trust God with the first 10%. So the first thing here, the first truth is, it's a tenth. The second thing I wanna tell you is the tithe is a test. The tithe is a test. How do we know this? Well, tithe, we, we broke it down, it's 10%, but when you read the Bible, you also find out that the number 10 is, is a picture of testing. Remember, there were 10 commandments, and we've gotta face that test every day because we wanna go the opposite direction of many of those things, and, and God says, I'm gonna test you with, with the law, and then there's also there were 10 plagues, remember, that, that God used to try to get Pharaoh's attention. And if you study the Israelites and their journey, there were 10 different times that God tested them in the wilderness. So 10 is the number of testing. And I'm here to tell you, every time you and I get paid, it is a test. Will you trust God? Or will you trust your own wisdom, your own ways? Or will you listen to your own fears? Or will you trust God? Because hear me, God and his ways will lead you to your ultimate freedom. But if you trust in your ways, you're gonna continue to be bound up. And we need to get the truth about what the tithe is. The third truth is this, the tithe is timeless. The tithe is timeless. So the tithe is a tenth, the tithe is a test, and the tithe is timeless. Now, remember, a lot of people are gonna use this excuse today. Well, tithing, that's under the law. Therefore, it doesn't need to be kept anymore. But I don't know about you, anytime I hear someone say it's under the law, it just tells me they don't really know their Bible that well. Because when you really, really study, if you wanna look back at the law and you go a little, a little bit even sooner than when we had the law, about 100 years, you would find that tithing precedes and predates the law. Because hundreds of years before God ever gave the law to Moses, Abraham gave God a tithe. We're talking about before the law. He gave an offering, a 10% offering to the priest to honor God. So the father of the faith, before there was ever the law, was tithing and giving to God. It's timeless. And by the way, tithing goes beyond the law. Jesus endorsed tithing. Look at it with me. What did Jesus say in Luke 11 regarding the tithe? Luke eleven forty two. But woe to you, Pharisees. He says, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. Watch this, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Jesus was saying, you people are so religious that you tithe every, you tithe even on your spices, your mint and your dill and all that. But he said, you've neglected the more weightier matters. You should have done both. And so maybe you read that and you say, yeah, but Pastor Daniel, Jesus is obviously saying you shouldn't just tithe. You should also go ahead and do that. But also it's about love and justice. That's the emphasis, Pastor Daniel. Jesus is saying we got to have love and justice. And it's not just about being a tither. And I'm saying it's both. Jesus said, either way, Jesus says you should do one without neglecting the other. This was the perfect opportunity for Jesus to tell us tithing wasn't important or necessary anymore. But as he sees religious people doing it, he says, you shouldn't just do that and not do this. You should do both. I'm here to tell you, Jesus endorsed tithing because he knows that it teaches us to trust the Father. So the tithe is timeless. It was practiced hundreds of years before the law. And today, 
we're gonna extend to everybody a 90 day tithe challenge. In fact, I'd like you to do something for me. I'd like for you to look in the seat pocket in front of you and just go ahead and reach forward and grab that card on the left side that says 90 day challenge. Even if you're not, or you think you might not take this challenge, just go ahead and grab the card so you can look at it and read it with me. And here's what we're doing. For the next 90 days, we wanna challenge you. And if you're joining us online, there's a link coming up right there. You're not left out. You can click that link and look at this card. And here's where this is coming from. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says this. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Now that word excel there just simply means grow. Because if you're giving at any level, Paul is saying, since we excel, let's also excel and grow in this grace of giving. And today, here's what we're gonna do. As we get ready to pray and pass the giving containers, I want you to take that card and read it and just consider. If you're sitting on a front row, just ask the person behind you to hand you a card. They'll do it. You say, well, who, who, who's this for, Pastor Daniel? It's for everyone. In fact, I've got one up here today. Heather and I are gonna renew our commitment today to say, hey, God, we're gonna put you to the test for 90 days and we're gonna watch you open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing that we're not gonna be able to contain it, that we're gonna have to help those who are in need. We're gonna be blessed to be a blessing. I wanna encourage you to consider filling this out today, online as well. And when we pass the giving containers, maybe you've been a faithful tither like me and Heather our entire marriage. I don't know that there's ever been any paycheck or anything that we've received that we haven't tithed on. But I'm still gonna take the challenge because I wanna be a part of this. Maybe you're here today and you've never tithed. This is the perfect thing for you to say, I'm gonna put my faith to the test. I'm gonna trust God. Maybe you've been faithful in giving and offerings, but if you'd be honest, you haven't been consistent with the 10%, the first 10%. And that's the principle. And maybe today you say, I'm gonna fill out this card. Look, it's just 90 days. If you don't think it'll work, just put God to the test like he said. And if it doesn't, then you can say, okay, well, it didn't work. But I'm telling you, it, it's gonna work in your life. We you know, we've done these things over the years and I, I can tell you over the years, we've had so many people come to us and say, thank you. I just had a family today come up to me and say, I'm so glad this church tells us the truth about this area and doesn't shy away from it and just hope people get it. No, but you understand the importance of this principle. And she said, I'm so thankful. She said, one day I'm gonna share with you the story of how God used this in our lives in this church. And I can't wait to hear that story. So, I encourage you today to fill that card out. I'm gonna fill it out. In fact, let's just take 30 seconds for everyone to consider filling this out. And the hosts are gonna just get ready and in just a moment, they're gonna pass these giving containers. I'm saying, Lord, I'm re up. I'm taking the 90 day tithe challenge. Thank you, Lord. As I put you first, I'll trust you and I'll watch you do it. The last thing I wanna leave you with today, and I wanna ask everybody just to lean in here, everybody online. I'm just, I'm just thinking like, how awesome would it be if next Sunday, everyone in our church family brings the tithe? How incredible would it be if 100% of everyone who calls Chapel Hill their church home, that on next Sunday, we brought a tithe to honor God with the first because here's the thing, it's the end of the month, so sometime between now and next Sunday, most of us in the room are gonna get paid somehow. We're gonna get a direct deposit or get a check or someone's gonna hand us some money and somehow we're gonna get some kind of payment for our work between now and next Sunday. Here's what I'd like to ask you to do between now and next Sunday, be aware of that money that comes in and say, God, I'm gonna take the first tenth and on Sunday, March 3rd, next Sunday, what would happen if everyone in our church, many maybe for the first time, many are just saying, I'm gonna continue to be faithful. What would happen if we all on the same day, literally as the Bible says, brought the tithe and gave 10%. Now, some of you, I know you're gonna tithe between now and next Sunday throughout the week, but some of you, maybe next week, you'll just come ready to fill out that envelope when we have that time and say, I'm gonna put God first. And I promise you, and the reason why I can promise you, I can promise you this, is because it's right here in this book. It's true. You will be blessed. You will live large. God will expand your territory. And listen, don't tithe to get more. Tithe to get in the right place with God. Say, God, I want to be in right alignment. I want to be a part of your economy. And God's going to do great, great things. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you right now. Father, in Jesus' name. And as I pray, I want to pray with those of you who are filling out the 90-day tithe challenge specifically. 
I want to commit to you that as I pray for you now, our pastors are going to pray for you this week. We're going to pray for you throughout these 90 days. We're going to pray for God's blessing and favor and prosperity to be upon you. And I'm also praying that God would call all of us next Sunday on March 3rd to bring the tithe. On the same day, we would all come and bring what I think could be the greatest offering we've ever brought on one day at Chapel Hill Church. So Lord, help us. Help us to see the tithe is a tent. Help us to see it's holy. Help us to see it's set apart, that we shouldn't try to take it or wear it or drive it or eat it or any of that. We should bring it to you. And Lord, I pray for every person who's filling out that card. And I pray for every person who's giving today and next Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen. As our host pass these giving containers, when it gets to the end of your row, you could just simply set it on the floor and they'll come back in just a moment to collect those. Thank you so much.